Oh, new computer. Need to. All right. What's the password for the Patreon? <laughs> I kind of like all that. You you realize all the garbage you need to leave behind and what's actually essential, right? No, it's been great. I've um, you know, it's been great. He said while pulling out his old computer to do it. <laughs> <laughs> From sciencesortof.com, you're listening to Science Sort of. Science, sort of. You are listening to episode 334. I am your host, Ryan, a beautiful mind, helped. And our theme this week is destruction breeds creation. Here to talk with me about things that are science, things that are sort of science, and things that wish they were science is Charlie, Master and Commander Barnhart. Pleasure to be here. And we are also joined by Abe, the gladiator, commander of the armies of the North, general of the Felix <laughs> Legions, and loyal servant to the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius Padilla. A su servicio. Doctores. He was the Spaniard, Abe. Ah. Decided to go with a Russell Crowe theme for introductions for absolutely no reason. (laughs) Sounds reasonable. (laughs) Just felt right to me. The beautiful mind guy was from West Virginia. I'm not actually thinking I'm that smart. Okay, so... um, With with that, speaking of things that make me feel like I'm not that smart, let's talk about Triassic extinctions, Abe. Let's... We're sort of combining two stories in our first segment, and they're actually two stories that sort of combine the fields that Abe and I are most familiar with. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, agreed. So listeners would probably guess one of them is going to involve a volcano. So, both? <laughs> uh, really? Two, both. Yeah. 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 Both involve volcanoes, both involve paleontology, and both involve carbon isotopes. Which so, I haven't worked with before. Surprisingly, because I've worked with, you know, volcanic systems quite a bit, but. So do you want to do, do you want to start at the beginning and work our way through time chronologically, or do you want to do this tenet style and start with the more recent event and work our way backwards? Ooh, let's do chronologic. Okay. So the chronologic story that we're going to talk about first is the discovery of a new mass extinction hidden within the Triassic. And Abe, this was a story you actually found and posted to the Slack. So did you want to talk a little bit about it or talk through the big, big picture and then we'll dive in? Sure. Yeah, it was an interesting story that I came across, namely because, you know, major mass extinctions are not, not many (laughs) and, you know, pretty obvious in the fossil record when all of a sudden you have a big, you know, set of fossils disappear from the record, then it's obvious that something dramatic happened. And so there are five, is that right? Five major mass extinctions. Yeah, the big five. The big five in the last 500 million years. And so to add an entire new mass extinction to that is, is a big deal because... Right. And a lot of and a lot of the ways that we have organized the, the geologic sort of epochs and eras and eons and all that stuff is based on extinction events, right? So like exactly. the, the, the KT boundary or the KPG boundary, as it's now known, doesn't, it, it's not a f- coincidence that that is also a mass extinction event because it's a, it's a create, it's a huge right. reworking of what we find in the fossil record. So when you start finding entirely new ecosystems, floras and faunas, it it's makes sense to era. say, okay, this is a new, yeah, it's a new era, something changed. And that change, you know, a lot of times is a big extinction event. Something significant, right. You know, so, so that's a big deal for, those reasons that, you know, either we fail to see something that should have been pretty obvious, or, you know, we have started to rethink data that's always been there and are now just recognizing that, oh, this is actually a big shift. And so in this case, it was observing carbon isotopes and and there is a noticeable shift at the is it beginning Triassic? It's sort of the middle middle of Triassic. The- it's called it's a it's called the Carnian. Carnian. That's what I was trying to remember. So the, yeah, the Carnian, and the shift in in carbon isotopes isn't particularly new, right? So I, first of all, just to correct myself, the Carnian is identified as the the first period of the late. Triassic. Late Triassic. Okay. I, I didn't know much about this carbon excursion. So I think to clarify a little bit, just because uh, I think most people, when they hear about carbon isotopes, they think carbon 14 dating. That is not right. what we're talking about. And it's not what we're talking about for a couple different reasons. One reason is that carbon dating is actually only works on relatively recent samples. So you can only go back with carbon dating about 50,000 years, I believe. Is that correct? Sounds right. 
<laughs> that says, you have no idea. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Listen, I use that seems uranium. so short. Like, how do they how do they date um, early hominids? I believe they have to. I'm not an expert in this at all, but there are a bunch of. So the the way carbon dating works is that carbon 14 is radioactive. And so it breaks down predictably over time. That's the half life. Right. And so you can measure the amount of carbon 14 in an object. And based on how much is left, you know, you can then estimate when that object was formed based on the amount of carbon-14 incorporated in the, in the initial formation of the thing. There are other methods for radiocarbon dating, Charlie. So there are other atomic species that have much longer half-lives but can still be measured with enough precision to do dating. So there's like argon-argon and, and a bunch of other ones that go way back in time. And some of them have half-lives that, you know, put them well within reach of the origin of the universe. So... Yep. There's a lot of lot of options for dating that don't rely on carbon, and this is one of the one of the reasons that you know we have issues with like sometimes when creationists are trying to claim that dinosaurs are much younger than than the paleontological community claims, they'll do like carbon dating on a dinosaur fossil and they'll be like, "Ha, this dinosaur fossil is only fifty thousand years old." And I'm like, "Well, that's because that's, that's the max, <laughs> right? If you have a thermometer that only goes to hundred degrees and you put it in boiling water. You're going to think that boiling water is only hundred degrees. I know I'm." very Fahrenheit <laughs> centric yeah. example there. But when the max of your yardstick is, is, yeah, if you tried to measure a football field with a yardstick, it would be a yard long, right? <laughs> cool. I would love to see a, um, a chart that shows time into the past on the X axis and then like plots of different isotope dating schemes that, that envelope specific times, time periods and where the overlaps occur, where one becomes useful, where one becomes useless. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure something like that exists. And I mean, they even have that for like tree ring, right? You can use tree rings going back a certain amount of time, but then they max out sort of with some of the oldest trees. And the type of carbon isotopes we're actually talking about in this study are stable carbon isotopes. So carbon comes in three flavors, carbon 12, which is the vast majority of carbon, carbon 13, which has one extra neutron, and carbon 14, which has two extra neutrons. And those those neutrons make tend to make the nucleus a little inherently unstable. But it turns out, with only one extra neutron, the nucleus is still stable enough that it doesn't decay radioactively. When you throw in that extra second neutron, it the mass sort of ends up, makes it less stable to the point where it does radioactively decay. So the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12 are the ratio of carbon isotopes that we're talking about here. And those are persistent over time because the carbon-13 doesn't break down. So you can use it to measure various attributes either in fossil tissues or paleosols or other carbonate samples, things that have carbon, obviously, and different types of processes like volcanoes produce different ratios of light carbon 12 to heavy carbon 13, right, Abe? You said you've never really used carbon with volcanoes before though, right? That's correct. So I I think what, what the carbon here is measuring, it's a marker of essentially how much carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas emissions these volcanoes are putting out into the atmosphere. That's right. And so carbon being emitted into the atmosphere is is dominantly light carbon, so carbon 12. And so going back to, you know, processes that can change the composition or that ratio of carbon 13 to carbon 12, basically we we call this fractionation and different processes affect this ratio differently and a lot of that has to you know has to do with sorting heavier carbon versus lighter carbon in the same way that we you know in my in my realm we use oxygen isotopes um, but it's a very similar concept you know with oxygen isotopes heavy oxygen gets concentrated in the oceans whereas light oxygen can evaporate and it's concentrated you know via rain on continents or snow on glaciers and so this fractionation effect can basically tell us about some of the processes that are taking place on Earth's surface at a particular time. So when we start to look at carbon in this Triassic area, or era, what we want to know is where was that carbon shifted, right? So if we're putting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere, then you're essentially preferentially increasing the amount of light carbon in the atmosphere compared to heavy carbon. And so you can measure that ratio because things that take up carbon, like plants or organisms that create shells that eventually get fossilized, they preserve that ratio of carbon in 
in their shells or in their parts in, in wherever they are storing the carbon. So in the case of plants, it would be in the, the plant tissues or the wood. And so we use this to kind of get a sense and, you know, piece back together what this atmosphere, you know, the, the environment would have looked like. How the, and how the environment was changing and what was right. causing those changes. Right. And so when we, you know, we refer to a shift in carbon that was observed for this particular time, generally a big shift in carbon, you correlate to some big event that, you know, was um, either powerful enough to be able to alter that composition or, you know, that, that ratio of carbon. And so volcanoes tend to be one of the first things we think about because a really large volcanic event pumps a lot of carbon into the atmosphere by means of uh, methane and, and CO2, carbon dioxide. And so that can, in a very short span of time, significantly shift that ratio of carbon that is then preserved by organisms that follow and grow or you know develop after this event. And we, we know, or at least based on the, the study we're talking about here, which was published in Science Advances by a pretty large team, but led by Jacopo Del Corso, and I believe included Mike Benton, who had noticed that there was this shift in some of the fossils he was studying back in the 80s at around this time in the Triassic, but didn't really have an explanatory mechanism for thinking about it more in depth. And so now we have some some new data. And it looks like the volcanoes that caused this were the volcanoes that formed in what is now the Atlantic Ocean during the breakup of Pangaea. Is that right, Abe? Yeah. So at the time, so there was the, the beginning of the breakup of Pangaea. Essentially, you get a rift. And when you have these significant events like, you know, a continent breaking up, it's both long lived and dramatic. And so it was a pretty major volcanic episode that basically created the modern Atlantic. And so and they call this the Ran- Rangelia. Yeah. So, so this is, it's what's known as the Rangelia province of Western Canada. And it's a very large, uh, large igneous province, which we tend to think of like very voluminous eruptions. It's usually basalt, much like what you would see in Hawaii, but it, it's not always that there are more silicic, uh, large igneous provinces, but by and far, these LIPs tend to be flood basalts, which come out at a high rate of eruption because they're very fluid and they're long lived. And so in relatively short amount of time, geologically speaking, you can put out a lot of volcanic products. A lot of basalt can be erupted. So this event is associated with the Western coast of North America breaking up. And then it's seemed like this sort of spike in greenhouse gases and global warming was associated with increased rainfall. So you have a lot more rainfall happening, which dramatically changes the flora and fauna available for about a million years. And then the earth kind of dries back out again and the flora and fauna changes back again. And so we're, we're looking at a couple of different correlations here. We're looking at the timing of this large igneous province erupting, the timing of the diminishing of certain groups of animals and the rapid expansion of other groups of animals. And so we're seeing the diminishment of some of these really ancient sort of reptilian-esque lineages of herbivores. And then we're seeing the expansion of a a lot of different kinds of animals, including dinosaurs. So we've known for a long time that dinosaurs really started diversifying and spreading around the world, as well as other major groups of reptiles including, you know, turtles and phytosaurs, which are like crocodile-like animals, and crocodilomorphs, which are actual crocodile-like animals. So we're, we're seeing these groups sort of expanding, and we'd known that the dinosaurs had, had expanded for a long time, and I think there was always a suspicion that there must have been something going extinct to create the sort of open ecological niche space. But now we're also seeing sort of a causal mechanism for what might have been driving that, and it's, again, this sort of in- imbalance of carbon in the atmosphere that's creating a trickle down effect to the plant communities that were supporting the animals living on land. And you got to remember, like, this is a a very different world we're talking about here. Like, it's not the kind of plants that that we think about today. And it's not the kind of animals we're thinking about today. And it's also not the kind of continental rainfall dynamics we're thinking about today, because you've got Pangaea, it's this giant landmass, and and rain just works differently on a continent that big. Right. Yeah. So to to dumb it down, um, tremendous amount of volcanism pumps a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. A lot of CO2 in the atmosphere warms the atmosphere. Warmer a- atmospheres can hold more water. They're steamier, and that leads to more rain, which 
it can drastically change fauna and flora in in the current ecosystem. It kills some things, makes other things grow, may lead to acidification in the ocean, for example. A lot of things going on, but it basically is volcanoes equals global warming equals more rain. And life yeah. responded. Yep. Um, People and, dying and 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 surviving. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would like to correct. I, I mentioned earlier it was a breakup of the western part of North America. It was actually accretion. So it was a large igneous province formed basically on an oceanic plateau that then got subducted onto the coast of North America. And and as that accretion was happening, there was a significant amount of volcanism associated with it. So the rocks are still there because they were essentially, you know, rammed into North America. Well, that's crazy. So there, all this, all this lava—is that the right word? All this, um, yep, was flowing all over, building a big landmass on a plateau. But then that plateau was also being subducted back into underneath those those volcanoes, and so it's this massive like rolling wheels of destruction and creation all at the same time. More or less. So the ocean plateau was being formed, you know, off coast on the ocean. So the thinner part of the oceanic crust was being subducted. But then once that big mass of accumulation of lava and crust reached the coast of North America, it was too thick to subduct. And so it becomes what we call accreted, just added on to the rest of the landmass. So basically literally just shoved up against it. Oh, and scraped onto it. Crazy. Yep. And it seems like, Charlie, you were talking about the acidification of the oceans as a response to the extreme volcanism and carbon dioxide being pumped into the atmosphere. And it does seem like this is the event that in addition to, you know, I was mostly talking about land animals when I was talking about the changes in the flora and fauna. But this also seems to be the event that sort of pushes modern like corals into building re- their modern esque reef like structures, which is really cool. So we know that like corals are really sensitive to the, the pH of the water that they live in. So to think about the fact that like w- this forcing event is sort of what pushed them Big to enough. evolve their their current scleractinian skeletal structures is pretty cool yeah it's nuts you know, it remains to be seen if this will sort of be designated as, as the number six in the, the big mass extinction schema. Something that I think people who don't think about deep time and paleontology don't think about as much is that there's always extinctions happening. It's called the background rate of extinction. So a mass extinction is more or less defined by how much the absolute rate of extinction at a moment surpasses the background rate of extinction. And when you start seeing sort of the collapse of ecosystems because so many things are going extinct that the whole the whole way the ecosystem functions kind of breaks down and falls apart. So it'll be interesting to see. This is one of those stories where it's like they're proposing, you know, this Carnian pluvial episode as one of the the big mass extinctions in Earth history. And it certainly was a major mass extinction event. Whether or not it'll be it'll rise to the ranks and join the big five to become the big six is interesting to to think about and it's something I'll, I'll be paying attention to but it does um so this happened 234 to 232 million years ago and then about 34 to 32 million years after that the triassic ends and it ends in a another extinction yeah. <laughs> so pretty major one yeah well that is definitely one of the the big big five right yeah so yep. third largest yeah, that's a good question. It's, I believe. Yeah, I think that might. So Permo Triassic number one, KPG and then is KPG number two. Is the second, and then is the, the and Triassic. Yeah. And Triassic, and, and into the Jurassic. So again, like the reason that we end the Triassic and start the Jurassic is because this extinction happens. And it turns out volcanoes might be playing a role again, right, Abe? That's right. So this time we go across the continents to the other side. Well, there's with, only one continent at the time. That's right. Well, so I was going to say with... <laughs> with Maybe to this, the middle of the continent, weirdly enough. Oh, that is actually an excellent point. Uh, yeah. So with this previous, you know, late Triassic extinction we just talked about, it was still, you know, things were sort of still accre- accreting or collecting into what became a single supercontinent, but those, you know, are not long lived. And so at some point, the shifts in tectonic activity started to tear this supercontinent apart. And so at the time, basically, we had a formation in Pangaea, but as Pangaea started to break apart, the 
The rift that was created is now known as the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, as basically what became the Atlantic Ocean. So we have a similar situation where you have all of a sudden, you know, major tectonic shift and a significant increase in magmatism and volcanism on the surface. So once again, you go back to spewing tons and tons, well, in this case, hundreds and millions of tons of material, carbon dioxide and, and sulfur dioxide and methane up into the atmosphere. So you have this cycle all over again of like, forcing carbon into the atmosphere, which, you know, has the runaround effect as Charlie was and Ryan were describing. And so we should say that this this is from a research article published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. First author is Callum Fox. It's also got Paul Olson on the paper who has done a lot of work in this area. So, so they, were, they were using carbon isotopes to basically figure out, you know, what were volcanoes Mostly, what were volcanoes contributing to the atmosphere, contributing to the oceans in their in terms of their carbon around the time that this extinction occurred? That's right. And so one of the things that they started to look at more carefully is methane, basically, which contributes uh, volcanoes contribute light carbon via methane into the atmosphere pretty heavily, isotopically light methane. Again, you know, we see a shift in the isotopic com- carbon isotope composition. And with this extinction, what we're seeing is a bunch of carbon dioxide getting dumped to the ocean, which is creating ocean acidification. We're also seeing a warming event caused by the CO2 getting into the atmosphere. That warming event is melting whatever ice happened to be on the continent. So we're seeing a dilution of the salinity gradients of the oceans. So the oceans are now more acidic, less salty, warmer. <laughs> like <laughs> it's, a, it's a bad combo for a lot of animal, a, a lot of life that yeah. was living in the oceans at the time. Soup's getting funky. So, so what we tend to find is in these nearshore preserved environments, we tend to find basically just algal microbial mats of slime were the things that were able to, to do well in these sort of warm, oh. brackish, <laughs> acidic waters. <laughs> and and I, I believe that's what they were sampling for the, these carbon isotopes. So Yes, they, they were taking traces of, of organic molecules, I think, in the fossil record is what they mentioned. Biomarkers. And these were samples taken from the Bristol Channel in the UK. Is that those Atlantic eruptions still going on? Is that what Iceland and the Azores are? Yeah. Or is it a new thing that's do, that made Iceland and the Azores? So Iceland is actually particularly unique because it's the Atlantic rift, but also a hotspot. And okay. so they're sort of superimposed, creating, you know, like a hotter magma zone that then leads to volcanism on the surface. But the entire Atlantic Rift, the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Rift is still pretty volcanically active. The Azores, I believe, are their own hotspots. So they're kind of like why separate just on their own. But the, the point is, this is a process that is still ongoing. Correct. But it must have happened at a crazy rate back then to cause all these changes. That's right. Absolutely. And so what this study did is they were sort of, when when paleontologists study mass extinctions, we often refer to looking for the smoking gun. We're looking for what was the main driver that caused the extinction? Because a lot of times, once the extinction gets going, a lot of things are happening it, simultaneously, and I'm, I'm making scare quotes with my hands because it's geologic time simultaneous, so we might be talking millions of years here. But it's a lot of things happening simultaneously just because so much has to go wrong for a mass extinction to, to happen. But we're always looking for what was the, the principal driver, what was the main thing that set the, the set everything in motion. And in this instance, it seems to be that the split up of Pangaea, while a massive worldwide event, also happened to set off this Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, which may have been the main contributor to the atmospheric and oceanic changes needed to get that mass extinction really going. Right. And I think I, I want to end this segment by making the point that I know we've made on the show before, but I think it's important to make again. And it's when you study mass extinctions, which is something paleontologists do, pretty much other than the end Cretaceous KPG extinction, every mass extinction in Earth history has been caused by an imbalance of carbon in the atmosphere. <laughs> and, Every single- you know, and it's an Wait, it's a is this a cautionary point. story? 
No, it, not it at just all. might be. It just <laughs> might be. And, and there are folks who argue that volcanism played a large role in the end KPG extinction and that the asteroid was sort of just icing on the cake and wasn't really the, the main driver. I'm a little bit more in asteroid camp, but like there was a lot of volcanism happening at the same time and it could have been a one two punch. But the point is when our atmosphere carbon load is in is imbalanced like an imbalanced washing machine things get wild (laughs) um, and it's not usually a good thing and and, you know and the the authors of this study go ahead you know do do go and point out that the the shift in carbon that they observe you know that that they attribute to this opening of you know the proto-atlantic ocean it doesn't line up with the extinction event itself there's a little bit of a lag time. And so this is where, you know, going back to, it's important that that difference is basically the amount of time it took the emissions, the carbon pumping into the atmosphere to change the environment and cause, cause the extinction. So it wasn't, so it, it's not an instant instantaneous event. It's, you know, reshaping the entire yeah, ecosystem. It's, that, it's not a bullet, it's a poisoning. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's a, that's actually a very apt analogy or, or way to phrase it, Charlie. I think that that does sum it up nicely. So yeah, you, you got to keep your carbon balanced in your atmosphere and in your oceans. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, not good. And what are, you know, what are some charming creatures that were lost? I know that there's this whole like fashionable bias towards things that are charming in the animal kingdom that Ryan is particularly against, but I'm, <laughs> I'm a lay person. And so what, what do I wish was still around that was lost in either of these two extinctions? That is an excellent question. I would say I, again, lean more towards the terrestrial vertebrate group. And so, Where, well... What about cephalopods? Was ammonites lost? Because those they, they were supposed to be smart. Who knows? Sorry, wrong question. I, no, no, no. I'm, <laughs> I don't know when they went extinct. <laughs> So it's, it's all got to be like Cambrian explosion, guys. So yes, shelled cephalopods suffered a big hit at the end Triassic. But Nautiluses are still around. So they are, I guess they win at life in general. <laughs> I think Ammonites are, are, were a big loss from the end Triassic. I mean, like, they're fantastic. They're gorgeous. And, and yeah, we have Nautiluses today, but I wish we also had Ammonites still today. Yeah, they're like the evolved Pokemon of the Nautilus. Basically. <laughs> and then I think that's a, a great answer. I'm going to give it up for a group of reptiles called the Aetosaurs. I think I'm saying that right. They're just this really cool, funky, charismatic group of reptiles that are no longer with us thanks to the end Triassic extinction. I just put a link to their Wikipedia page in the chat, Charlie, so you can go check it out. But yeah, they're like these cool, like armored lizards, and they got like, you know, big kind of bulbous bodies but these cute little faces wonderful animals sad they're not around oh yeah those things are awesome and oh. and, and i guess the the final final point like I a, you could paddleboard that thing oh yeah <laughs> and they seem super chill like they're you know they're just herbivores they're just chilling hanging out yeah they would have been super fun to have around today And I think the final point I will make is that one of the other arguments I've heard that people who are skeptical of climate change make is, you know, how do we know that the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere is from fossil fuels? And it's, again, these carbon isotopes, they're pretty indicative. So the fact that we know what the carbon isotopic composition of fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, we know what their signatures ought to look like. And that's what we're seeing in the atmosphere. So it is, it is a pretty strong piece of evidence <laughs> that the, the, ex, yeah. the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now is from us. Yeah. <laughs> so um, We spilled the beer and the stuff on the floor looks yellow and it tastes like beer. Well, speaking of spilling beer, Charlie. I, I tried to do that for you. I appreciated that a lot. <laughs> and I'm going to use that to walk us on over to, to get a refill in the segment that we call What Are We Drinking?
that'll be an episode of Science Sort of, but we didn't talk about what we are drinking. I heard Abe crack a can open while I was trying to transition. So, Abe, I guess that means you have volunteered to go first. <laughs> Always happy to go first because it means I get to the beer faster. So I am drinking a um, Benchtop IPA. I've been trying to drink local as much as possible over the last, well, since I moved to Virginia, it was an opportunity to explore local breweries. And so Benchtop brews in Norfolk, Virginia, and they've had a few beers that are themed after science, which obviously makes me like them even more. So right now, the beer that I'm drinking is called Science is Crushable. It's an IPA at uh, 7% ABV. And this is actually one of the few cans that doesn't have, surprisingly, at least what the hops are in it. That has become a, a thing. People identify yeah. the hops. It's pretty delicious. It reminds me more of a West Coast IPA, which is kind of surprising to find on the East Coast. Sure is. They don't like to, they don't make it easy for us. Well, that's great. I'm glad you're enjoying that. I'm glad you're keeping it local. I rely on you to keep me, you know, because you have become such like a East Virginia beer aficionado, I have leaned pretty heavily into the Maryland (laughs) side of things. I've been trying to like make sure I know what's going on up there because I know you're going to keep me up to date with what's going on in Virginia. I got you covered. Charlie, you want me to go next or you want to take it? You seem to pontificate, so I'll I'll go quick. (laughs) I seem to. You always do. Yeah, I just do. (laughs) Why hedge? (laughs) So uh, my good friend, Dr. Aaron Todd at the Anchorage Volcano Observatory, we have a beer exchange that we do in the winter to get us through the darkness. And we do it with particularly dark beers. And he sent me Tired But Wired from Anchorage Brewing Company, which is a fantastic avant-garde brewery up there. The artwork on the can is phenomenal. It's from Wolf Skull Jack. She does like very metal primal dark drawings this particular one shows a dystopic post-apocalyptic skeleton wired up to a bunch of batteries so is some like cyborg trying to live through it all but apparently did not and this is an imperial stout that's fermented and aged in missouri oak and it's finished on coconut and coffee and blended with whiskey and clocking in at 5.5 abv so it will be very interesting because it's got uppers and downers. And you're not supposed to mix those things, kids, but I'm doing it. <laughs> well, Charlie, you actually, it's great that you went when you did because I have a similar beverage. Oh, that's thick, that. thick and coconutty. That's good. I am drinking a Kitty Claw cl- Clarified Cafe Milk Punch. And that is from a is from a restaurant here in D.C. called Mercy Me, a sort of South American cafe restaurant and bar. I, I had to be in downtown D.C. Don't worry. It wasn't I wasn't storming anything. I was just <laughs> there for an appointment. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I had some time to kill and I wasn't allowed inside the building. So I, I was wandering around and I found this cafe called Mercy Me. And they had a they literally had a sloth on the door. And then I walked inside and it was all like South American themed and I bought a hat. I just sent I text you guys a photo of the hat. <laughs> Abe's seen the hat. But Charlie hasn't seen the hat before. So I got myself a cool pink sloth hat, which I'm super oh, nice. excited. Yeah, that's great. And um, I, they had these amazing bagel sandwiches and they had all this, they had this great stuff. So they have like this great baseball cap with a pink sloth on it. They have these bottled cocktails. I was so excited by everything I got there, including these bagel sandwiches that Charlie, I'm not even kidding. I forgot to order a cup of coffee. <laughs> 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 so I like I like was getting my bagel sandwich and then I was like I realized oh wait there, nobody's handing me a coffee and I forgot to order a coffee and then I looked to the the line and of course you know it's at six foot distance it's now well out the door and I'm like no and so I was just had to eat my eat my bagel sandwich dry because I wasn't coffee about to break, I wasn't gonna break into the cocktail <laughs> that early so this is a mercy me kitty claw clarified cafe milk punch it is a reposada tequila masala chai coffee aleppo pepper lime and then again I, I, are you guys Ooh. familiar with clarified cocktails no. milk clarified cocktails familiar Not even with a clarified butter where you boil off like the water it's completely different so clarified milk cocktails they're they're actually pretty popular in dc and it's a process that goes back to like i believe the revolutionary era and what you do is you essentially make a batch cocktail that you then introduce milk to. And obviously the cocktail is, is by nature going to be on the acidic side. And so the milk curdles 
and in curdling the milk curdles bind with a bunch of like the different chemicals in your batch cocktail and they essentially act like a filter for certain flavors and they completely change the flavor and the the color and the clarity of the cocktail so you you pour a bunch of milk in the milk curdles settles out and then you strain that through a strainer to get the actual milkness you know you don't you're not drinking milk curds and then you have this cocktail that's actually been like filtered by the introduction of milk weird i wonder if there might be some culinary use for because basically you made ricotta sort of yeah but, but you it made might like, be it's gonna be funky because normally you make ricotta with lemon juice right so like mm-hmm. I wonder, or paneer <laughs> yeah and i'm drinking it in a glass that my buddy gordon sent me from the tiki bar in his neck of the woods of indiana this tiki bar is called the inferno room from indianapolis so it's like a cool bamboo fence with skulls on it and fire, and it's just an excellent tiki glass. And I'm drinking this cocktail. This cocktail is wild. It's actually got a good bit of spice to it, which is weird because Aleppo pepper is not that spicy, typically. It's super, super coffee y. Minus two. Man, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have a great high from this, but a weird hangover, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. You only live this once. Is- this is so like bold and interesting that I think if you had if you had blinded me to the ingredients, I would have a hard time telling you this was even tequila. <laughs> huh. Even with the reposado? Yeah. Cause the chai and the coffee and the pepper, like it's it's really yeah, it almost tastes like boozy coffee. And I'm not a guy who likes putting like a shot of whiskey in my coffee. Like I don't enjoy that. But this is working for me. This is very good. Nice. Yeah, those are pretty dominant flavors, actually. You know, but I think coffee and tequila actually together. coffee and tequila, I think, go together almost better than coffee and whiskey. Yeah, I would agree, man. A friend of mine gifted me a single batch Irish cream for Christmas. Man, that was that was quite the gift. But I she made me struggle because like for the first time in my life, I thought about like putting it in my coffee in the morning. And I was like, no, don't do not go down that road. So I didn't. <laughs> It's been, a, it's been a tough year for those kind of decisions. <laughs> yeah. uh, Charlie, you said through the art on that bottle, and that is awesome. That, that is fantastic. Ab- absolutely epic. Well, if you guys did want to start a fight over what, what kind of booze you would put in your coffee, we would be maybe exhibiting some mongoose-like behavior, and that's what we're going to talk about in our next segment. The War of the Mongoose. It's- So this is a story I'm super excited to talk about. I'm so excited to talk about it that I actually have already talked about it on a different podcast. Matthew LaPlante was kind enough to invite me back onto Undisciplined for his November Science News Roundup last year in 2020. Uh, It was right around when all the vaccine stuff was coming out. So if you want to hear a guy who's very cynical about vaccines and was basically right, you can go listen to that. I will link to it in the show notes. But my sort of for fun science story that I I talked about briefly then that I'm very excited to to talk about in a little more depth now is a story titled, I'll read the, I'm going to read the scientific headline first, and then I will read the, the headline headline. So it is from a article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America. First author is Rufus Johnstone, and the title is Exploitative Leaders Incite Intergroup Warfare in a Social Mammal. And then the headline title for the newspaper writers out there is female banded mongooses start wars so they can mate with rival males. Where do we even begin? So excited. I think we begin in Jersey Shore. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds about right. Uh, I believe we actually begin in Uganda. So this study was looking at banded mongooses. So mongooses are... And that, as far as I know, that is the correct plural for a group of mongooses. How much do you guys even know about mongoose? 
I'm st- it, well, I know they started manufacturing mongooses in like the late 80s. I, what do you mean manufacturing? Jesus, some product oh, man, that I'm way over your with. head. Yes, so. <laughs> Mongoose bikes were like the BMX. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, 80s yeah, yeah. and 90s it was like the bike to have when I was a kid. I only know that they're they're very social, like they live in colonies. Yes. So they're a small carnivorous mammal. They belong to the family Herpestidae, which, so you might think a mongoose looks a lot like a weasel, but they're basically the cat group's answer to the weasel eco niche. What? So, so they're, they're it, within carnivora, the, the group that contains most of the terrestrial carnivorous mammals that you're familiar with. You have basically two groups. You have the caniniformes and the filiformes. So you have the dog shaped carnivores and the cat shaped carnivores. So within the dog shaped group, you have weasels, which are family mustilidae. And in the cat shaped group, you have the family herpestidae, which are the mongooses. So they're basically, if you start with a cat shaped thing, how do you turn it into a weasel? That's a mongoose. <laughs> Does that make sense? So, yeah, just yeah. not the name. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually don't know the derivation of the name. Apparently, it derives from Hindi, which would make sense. So, Charlie, you were correct. They're an incredibly social group of animals. They live in very large familial groups of up to 20 adults. And they're, they're highly territorial. They live in these groups and they tend to mate within these groups. And so what you tend to have happen is over the course of generations, these groups get increasingly inbred. And uh, as that, that inbreeding reaches a point where females recognize that they're not having as many viable pregnancies and they're not producing as much offspring as they could, And so females then have this incentive to find mates that are outside the gene pool, right? (laughs) And so when female mongooses go into heat, the males in the group just follow them relentlessly. So what the females have learned to do, at least according to this study, what they observed in this park in Uganda is the females will lead their group. So basically the females get to steer the ship because the males are going to go wherever they go. So, so the females will purposefully encroach on another group of mongooses territory. And then the males will all line up and fight each other. And they literally, there's videos of this. The, the article is, I believe it is open access and there is video in the article of this happening. And they literally line up like medieval battle lines and charge each other. (laughs) And so the males, you know, go crazy. They line up, they fight, and while they are fighting, the females will snag one of the males from the rival groups and quickly mate (laughs) in the middle of the battle. (laughs) And the the goal is for the female to essentially increase her reproductive fitness at the expense of all the other males in her group. And that's what makes this a really interesting biological study is because, you know, you you generally, for this sort of fitness increase, you can imagine that there would be a trade-off somewhere. But in this instance, the trade-off has nothing to do with the person receiving the benefit, the person, the mongoose receiving the benefit. It's the female mongoose has everything to gain by starting a fight and nothing to lose. <laughs> Which creates a self-reinforcing system of starting a lot of fights, <laughs> which I just think is fantastic. Like it's such a it's such a crazy situation. That, this is absolutely crazy. But I, before we just like get into the humor of it, I want to ask some more scientific questions. Sorry to be the buzzkill. Do mongoose have synchronous menstrual cycles? Like is evidence in in different primates? That's a good question. I don't actually know, but I I get the sense that it must be the more socially dominant females that are leading the charge on on this who have enough males following them. The article did mention that they tend to go into heat around the same time and, you know, go as far as giving birth on the same day within a particular group. So that even gives more um, evolutionary impetus for this behavior because they'll enhance genetic diversity even more so among the whole colony. So they found that the probability of starting these fights goes up based on the age of the group, not the age of any individual within the group, which is really interesting. It's like a higher level of, of sort of selection. 
And then, yeah, the the likelihood of starting a fight goes up when the females are in heat. So it does seem to be that the females recognize when it is opportune for them to start fights between the groups. And so they are doing it purposefully to create this scenario for themselves to get out out group mating opportunities. No, that's incredibly social. I mean, not to totally anthropomorphize, but it's not just Nietzschean death drive like, oh, I'm dying. So I want to reproduce with something else. It's like our whole group is getting real ugly. So let's yeah. let's fix this. And, and you know, it's fascinating that like the correlation is with keeping a diverse gene pool, right? Because as the group itself gets older, that means there's been more inbreeding, right? So the impetus to increase that gene pool and start a fight and go and mate with other groups increases. So it's I just find that fascinating. And a lot of times when we see males fighting over access to females sometimes it's within the same group sometimes the group structure is such that it's a little more open so there is like a flow in and out of the group you know you see this with like wolves and elk and like things like that and and a lot of times when males fight it's it's sort of for show it's not like to the death it's sort of like let's let's lock horns and see who's stronger and when it's obvious who's stronger the the less dominant individual will kind of give up and, and take their licks and move on to live, li- you know, live to fight another day as the saying goes. Right. Right. With these mongoose battles, males are getting messed up. <laughs> like, uh. So there, there is absolutely a decrease in the fitness of the males that are in these fights initiated by the females. But when you, again, when you think about it in the way you were describing Charlie, like the females have no incentive to protect the fitness of the males in their group because those are not good breeding partners for them because they're too closely related. Yeah. So I have another question. Are the females of the defending band, the rival band that is being attacked, are they present as well? Because what if, what if the males are kind of like, yeah, we'll get in this fight too, but I might find something more genetic, genetically diverse as well. I think what's happening I don't know the answer to that exactly, but what does seem to be the case is that it has seems to to be a super important question. Like shouldn't the researchers been like, do females from both tribes interbreed with the males from the opposite tribe at the same time? It seems like only the females who initiate these battles are getting the benefit. And that might be a function of the territoriality of the group. So like the females who initiate these fights are initiating it by purposefully encroaching on a different group's territory. And the, and if that territory, you know, if, if the group they're encroaching on, if the estrus cycles of the females in that group aren't right. synced up with the females in the other group, then mm. there isn't going to be the opportunity for the males of the attacking party to, to find females in the group that they are attacking because the female led them into the attack. So there might be a temporal shift there that, that creates a, a yeah. And that is a good point. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, good for them. (laughs) It's it's wild, man. Here, I'm going to, I'm going to send you guys one of these videos in the chat here. I just want you guys to see like the actual battle lines that are drawn. And I think, Charlie, even in this video, you can see that the attacking group, it's the entire group of mongooses, including the young pups, whereas yeah. the defending group, it actually looks like it might just That's be the, the male. males coming out to defend. <clears throat> that looks, yeah, I would say so. Okay. Holy crap. That's crazy. They even hold, like, a front line. It's wild. Man, they need to learn about flanking. And then in this second video, you can see one of these out-group mating events happening during the course of the battle, which is pretty awesome. Well, they're all out just attacking. (laughs) (laughs) That's nuts. Man, they live fast. Yeah. Yeah. Also, really high pitched screaming for your tiny animals. Super chirpy. Super yeah, chirpy. A lot yeah. Of cortisol going on there. So yeah, I thought this. You know, I thought this story was just on its surface. It seems sort of silly, and there's a lot of comments to be made on sort of group dynamics with humans. But like when you actually look at like genetically and the selection pressures that are happening here, it's super complex and really it's a really fascinating strategy that these female mongooses have developed to ensuring that the genetic diversity of their groups doesn't have basically a genetic dead end. 
No, yeah. it's awesome. And I, I get very reflective on my own species. I'm like, once again, we're not that special. Many other species exhibit very complex behavior for the sake of propagating that species. Yeah, and I, I mean, the, the paper even talks about this in the context of a, a classic hawk and dove model, which is exactly how we talk about politics among between countries, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> or within one country. Yeah, so I, you know, I was just super excited to talk about this. I got to talk about it a little bit on undisciplined, but I just, uh, I had so much fun thinking. I had so much fun understanding this system. Like I read the headline. I was like, that's a funny headline. And then as I read the paper, I was like, oh, this is like, there's a lot here. There's a lot here. This is a really cool system that I'm excited to learn about. So I was excited to share it with y'all and share it with the audience. Awesome. No, it's, it's great. I always love, you know, we so often think of animals being like us, but with, with a story like this, you can flip it around. You're like, well, if I was one of those mong goose, what would I be doing? I'd probably be like sitting 50 yards away. <laughs> and like, Man, this is, this is some crazy shit going on here. Well, you know, when, when you look at there's a figure in the paper that charts the um, mortality rate between males and females and the mortality rate based on uh, uh, intergroup mortality for females is around zero percent with one outlier of around two percent for males. It's a box and whisker plot that's median is 1%, but it goes up to about 3% with an outlier at 5% and down still to about 0%. So it's a pretty broad range for males. And so I guess, Charlie, you're, you're saying you would be in that lower quartile, just hovering as close to one as you could manage. <laughs> yeah, I would I would be in the trench writing a poem. <laughs> you, you're, I mean, the, you're the R.R. R. Tolkien of Mongoose. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Listen, it's the reasonable survival strategy, okay? <laughs> I don't know, man. I think you got to get out on the front lines to, and defend the, the group. Well, I guess it depends if you're in the aggressor group or the defending group, right? Right. Yeah, let's not go into it. We don't need to psycho, <laughs> psychoanalyze each other. <laughs> not each other. The mongooses. <laughs> well, if you have mongoose thoughts that you would like to share with us, please do. And if you do share them with us, you might be included in our final segment of the show. And that is the Paleo Pow. <laughs> segment of science sort of is feedback from the listeners you send us stuff we regurgitate it back out to you like little like we're the mama bird and your little baby birds and <laughs> we love doing it we, we'll never stop so we, we talked a lot about climate change this episode and we actually got some feedback on a previous episode where we also talked about climate change charlie do you want to read the comment from for episode 320 yes that was a <laughs> A very courtroom, yes. Just answer the question, witness. Yes. So I got a great comment from Travis, and he writes, Hi, I really enjoyed episode 320. Miss Becker was an excellent guest and made short work of translating her research into layman speak. I'd never considered the different mechanical properties of glacial ice from snow versus frozen sea ice. It would be great to have her back on the show in the future to report on the progress in the field or to dive deeper into specific topics. Thanks for the podcast, Travis. Yeah, so this is a really ice flows in very different rates depending on its temperature, depending on its composition, depending on its porosity and permeability, how much air is locked up into it, whether or not it has liquid water at its base or not. And so it's not all flavors of snow and ice are the same. And it it not only varies on our planet, but it changes drastically as soon as you go to Mars or even frozen moons like Callisto and Ganymede in Europa. Which is, I, I find, it's one of those concepts that like even thinking, even trying to put my mind in the deep time framework, it's hard to think about ice flowing for me. It's something I really have to like 
get conceptual with. But the episode in reference 320 is my interview with Maya Becker, who was telling me about her research looking at the Ross Ice Shelf using satellite data. But also she went to COP25, Charlie. So yeah. she has just a great perspective. And she wrote an op-ed for her local paper down in San Diego. Uh, she's with Scripps. And it, it was just a great perspective on like doing scientific research and then doing some of the policy outcomes of what that research means. And yeah, she was a great guest. And I would love to have her back on. I forwarded her that email just so she would know that positive feedback was out there. So yeah, glad, glad you wrote in Travis. Thanks for sharing. Ryan, we, you and I need to go glacier camping. I've camped in su- Southern Iceland, but there's many glaciers here in the Pacific Northwest. And if you sleep on a glacier, you're very aware that it's flowing. It, you don't sleep yes. well because it's just making noise all <laughs> and they time. are loud so i've been on yeah i've been on a glacier before but i didn't stay overnight so you uh you sold in the room i'm into it well abe i believe you have a comment from charles charles k i sure do so yeah we so we have a comment from charles k his comment is in regards to episode 308 in which ryan had a lovely chat with him Science comics discussing drawing science. Well, science comics can be hired science comedians. These science are science. Comedians. These are science comic book artists. Science comic book artists. I, there we go. And Charles says, "Great episode. I've always had my students illustrate scientific ideas. It takes a bunch of time, but their understanding is definitely increased. I've even started to include a draw this instead answer option for short essay questions. First of all." That's absolutely fantastic. (laughs) Sometimes it's a lot easier to draw things than to explain them, especially if you don't know the vocabulary, but you understand the concept. That can be equally valuable. You're you're definitely a guy who will sketch things out. And that's that's exactly what it's going to mention. You know, in my days of teaching at Vanderbilt, I spent quite a lot of time drawing things because it made it significantly easier to explain concepts to my students. And, and, you know, it's a fantastic tool that I think is usually underutilized, but yeah, science illustrations, they can go a long way if they're well done. So awesome. Charles, thanks for writing in and, you know, sharing your thoughts with us about this. Charlie, are there any of your classes where you could like introduce a draw it out instead of write it out answer style? Yeah, absolutely. I actually have a draw it out question in the homework I just assigned to Energy 101. Awesome. And it, it said, look around you and draw entropy. Whoa. Oh. That's, man, that's so Charlie. That's I love so it. cool, actually. <laughs> this comment reminded me of when I was in high school and I took AP Physics. And not the best AP Physics student, maybe a bit foolhardy of me to think I would major in physics when I went to college. <laughs> but my, my buddy Dan and I, we, we used to doodle a lot. He was a fantastic, was and is a, a very good artist and, and was far advanced compared to myself. But, you know, we would just doodle stuff. And it was usually like superheroes and comic books and stuff like that. I remember one time. So Dan, on exams, would do this. He would just draw instead of answering the question, but he would just draw whatever he wanted. He wouldn't actually draw the answer to the question. <laughs> yeah, sure. And it will work. It will work you know, as well. I remember one time specifically, we were supposed to be working on some lab. And this was a class that Jacob Stump and I, you know, a former host of the, the, the show and, and sometimes recurring guest, he can confirm this story because he was in the room when it happened. Dan and I were both doodling to ourselves instead of working on the work we were supposed to be working on, which was some lab assignment. <laughs> and our teacher, Bill Summers, not William, Bill, very insistent on that, came over and said, Ryan, get back to work. <laughs> I said, what are you yelling at me for, Bill? Like, Dan's doodling too. And he just leans into me and goes, Dan does not have to work. Dan is an artiste. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. It's so good. So with that, we have to do a little bit of an artistic endeavor ourselves, because if you do go to Patreon, much like Charles C. did, you are able to comment on the episode topics, which actually get posted early to Patreon. So if you're on Patreon, you get to see what we're going to be talking about before the episode comes out. And you get that at any level you subscribe to on the Patreon. But if you subscribe to the second tier, Avogadro's Army at six point two three dollars per month, you are granted a thesis for your efforts in this for-profit university we are running, Science Sort of Academy. And a thesis, this episode goes to Tyson G. So we have to come up with a thesis for what Tyson's been working on. Part of his pay-to-play degree, his BSSO, his Bachelor of Science, sort of. Okay. 
What if it starts with race against the volcano and then we tie in genetic pool continuity against extinctions? I wonder if there's something to do with like extinction rates of mongoose groups based on turf novel habitats. I was thinking like turf wars over novel igneous provinces, like new, like new, new lands are showing up from the magma and the mongooses mm-hmm. are trying to colonize them and it's creating turf wars. Yeah. Turf wars and extinctions. Turf war for genetic expansion. And ecosystem domination domination i like that <laughs> race against the volcanoes turf wars mongoose turf wars for genetic diversification and think of the before colon i think it might be like finding new birth in old miseries whoa but is birth b e r t h because it's where they're living I don't know. <laughs> right? Know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. That's a, is that that's what birth means, right? I think so. It's where you like moor a ship or it's your bunk. Yeah. So wait, finding new birth in old, old miseries. Miseries. Novel habitats provided by large igneous provinces induces turf War. wars in expanding mongoose populations uh, that's it i have not sold yet well, oh, okay i think that genetic diversity is more important than just a bigger population right yeah in diversifying diversifying mongoose populations in diversified territories, because then it can tie into the magmatic provinces as well. It doesn't have a it doesn't have a dumb acronym. That's the only thing it's missing. But how about finding new birth and old miseries by outrunning magma? Colon novel habitats provided by. I wanted to get racing the volcano thing in there. Genetically drifted expanding mongoose populations because genetic drift ah, is, yeah. is a thing that happens with a founder effect. So I think I think. All right, so Tyson, thank you for giving your committee time to discuss your work. <laughs> and, and what we have decided right. is that your thesis title that you have, have written and earned your BSSO is Finding New Birth in Old Miseries by Outrunning Magma. Novel habitats provided by large igneous provinces induces turf wars in genetically drifted expanding mongoose populations. Nicely done. Yeah. Good job, Tyson. Looking forward to the peer-reviewed journal article on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he was part of the academy, just throw it into PNAS. Uh, right? <laughs> Charlie, don't let the plebs in on the secrets of the <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Yeah, for those who don't know, if you want to submit an article, to, we, we covered two different articles from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and if you can find an academy member to join your paper. Good, good for you. <laughs> so we'll say. Yeah. That's uh, that said, definitely go watch the the mongoose movies. Yeah, they're... absolutely. We will be linking to the videos in the show notes. Go with God. I mean, science or whatever it is. Go to Elysium. To, to, let's bring it back around to Russell Crowe. Right. Yeah. I forgot to plug it the last episode, so I will go ahead and which would have been more appropriate since that was an episode about the movie Tenet, but this actually won't be. There'll be another episode out in between that episode and this episode. Uh, but I was on the iFanboy guys uh, review of Wonder Woman 1984. I will I will save my opinions for that. So go check it out there. And by the time this episode comes out. Oh, I would love to listen to that. Yeah. iFanboy? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, iFanboy, that show that I've been a guest on off and on for like the past decade or so. <laughs> I'm a fan of you. I'm not a fan of everything you do. Jesus not Christ. Of, not a fan of boys. That's why you have two daughters. <laughs> yeah. Man, they are so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time this episode comes out, I will also have done the animated brain trust episode with the iFanboy guys about Batman soul of the dragon, which is the new animated Batman movie 
that is coming out that is looks like based on the trailer it's going to be an absolute kung fu 1970s exploitation style movie and i am so excited haven't watched it yet so don't know what my review will be but that should be out by the time this episode comes out so go give that a listen if you are so inclined all right well thanks for joining me boys appreciate you taking the time yeah it's always a pleasure it's a lot of fun. Everyone listening, go check out sciencesortof.com for the show notes for this episode, links to the stories that we talked about, links to the Patreon page if you would like to support us month to month. Also links to just a basic PayPal link if you would like to send just a little bit of what, cash our way one time. And I'm not sure that I've told Abe and Charlie about this, but I've been trying to plug it on the show. We are now an affiliate with bookshop.org, which is an online book buying marketplace similar to other book buying South American river marketplaces you might be familiar with. But this book buying marketplace, bookshop.org, works with local bookstores in your area to fulfill the orders. So, you know, if Charlie went and ordered a book off of bookshop.org, it would come from a bookshop in the Bellingham area. Whereas if I went and ordered a book, it would come from a bookshop in the DC area. We have a page on- Oh, so it might come from the Nooksack River instead of that other river that's in (laughs) South America. Exactly. Or the Potomac, you know, Potomac.com. I actually just ordered a big batch of comic books. Wish I had known. Well, yeah, you got a bookshop. It's coming from my Vienna bookstore, though. So, so books can float nice. down different rivers and right. rivers near yeah. you. That's great. You don't have well, to just use the one river in, in South America. Well, mine's coming down a creek. So, <laughs> good Lord, well, and the creek don't rise. That's right. It will arrive. Well, if it rises, it'll get here faster, right? It'll get here faster. So, it, it's a really great website. They work with local booksellers, but they also work with folks like us as affiliates. So when it's it's just like the um, South American River one used to work, where if you click the link on our site, it'll take you to bookshop.org. Specifically, it'll take you to our shop on bookshop.org, which is bookshop.org slash shop slash science sort of. Anything you buy while you're browsing through that portal, the local bookstore in your area will get a little bit of money. You know, the author of the book will get a little bit of money and we will get a little bit of money. It's a really win-win-win for everyone involved. I'm trying to populate our shop page with books that we've either had authors on the show because we've had a lot of authors over the years or just books that we've talked about generally. So Charlie, Abe, if there are ever books you guys want to recommend, you know, science books or comics that you enjoy, just let me know. I can add them to the list. And it's just a, it's a great resource that we're hoping people who like the show will go take advantage of and support local bookshops in their area. Awesome. I I absolutely endorse this message. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. I do have actually one of my favorite science books, which is not fiction. It's called The Disappearing Spoon. Have either of you read it? I've not, but I believe it's on function. my nightstand, so Is I should it? open it. Charlie, read it. It's fantastic. Okay. It's the kind of book that like, I don't read very often, and I wish I did, but it, I, my attention span sometimes just doesn't work well for that. But The Sam Disappearing Keen. Spoon was, yeah. yeah, was one of the, you know, one of few books that stands out as I picked it up and... I put it down with regret and I was like, every time I was like, I want to get back to the book. I was so looking forward to picking it back up. It's a, basically a book of stories about how the periodic table of elements came together Yeah, and, you know, stories that relate to either the discovery of an element or something that influenced the discovery of, of an element or, you know, a lot of them tend to be really fun you know, comical stories about it. One of my favorites is gallium metal is particularly fun to work with because it's non-toxic, but it's also the the melting point of gallium metal is in the 70 to 80 degrees, which means that if you hold it in your hand, it can melt. And so the, right. the title of the book comes from an old trick called the disappearing spoon that chemists used to pull on other chemists. You would buy, you know, chunk of gallium metal shape it into a spoon offer it to your colleague with tea and as they used it to stir their tea the spoon would disappear into the tea so fun stories like that about wait and then it ends up in a toilet no 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 it it ends up at the bottom of the teacup and it's non-toxic so you can still drink your tea (laughs) but Uh. you can also recover it and reuse it for a new spoon 
and your next guest, <laughs> which is fantastic. So this is bookshop.org. <laughs> we need to find a lot of great books like this and yes. start populating this. Yes. So we'll please go ahead remind and me, add Please that. remind me, Ryan, because I've, I'm through this beer now and I okay. won't remember. Well, I believe uh, the author of that book, Sam Keen, I, I believe the Collapse Wave Function guys had him on their show while they were still producing content. And unfortunately, I don't think the Collapse Wave Function episodes are available at the moment, ah, but you've, you've inspired me to to write that wrong. It's a project that's been on my back burner for a while. So maybe by the time this episode comes out, they are available. It would be on our SoundCloud page, which is where all the backlog of Technically Speaking is currently alive if you would like to go back and listen to technically speaking so something i'm working on but disappearing spoon i will add it to our one of our lists or i might make a new list for for collapse wave function and it'll be there for your purchasing if you would like to check it out from bookshop.org slash shop slash science sort of awesome awesome that's all for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Send your feedback our way so we have content for the next time because we need the, the feedback that's not a naturally replenishing resource. That takes some effort. What we can guarantee we will replenish by the next time we come back to you with a new episode is that we will be able to give you a whole lot more science. Sort, sort of. of. Audio production for Science Sort Of is done by Rob Heath at Rob Heath Studios. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Tomare gato. Visit sciencesortof.com for show notes, links to all the stories we talked about, and ways to interact with the hosts, guests, and other listeners. Science Sort Of is brought to you by the Brachialobe Media Network of Podcasts. That's all for this week. See you next time on Science Sort Of. Doing the trek to Machu Picchu. Oh, wow. It was a five-day trek on Salkantai Pass, which passes under one of the large ranges in the Peruvian Andes. And in the middle of the night, we got woken up thinking that there was a train coming through the pass. Of course, there's no trains at that altitude. But apparently, a section of the glacier had collapsed from the summit and it just came rolling down the mountains. And it woke everybody up at like 3 a.m. And it was one of the most confusing things ever because I remember waking up at 3 a.m. and being like, we're camped too close to the train. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad you had that kind of delirium. Yeah. I had a lot more just like, well, that's way too loud of a noise. I guess I'm dead now. Count count to 60 <laughs> and wait for, wait for the impact, but then nothing ever happens. And other times it was just very Star Wars. Like you'd hear little laser sounds constantly. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's cool.